you know, when, when you're given a lot, um, you never get the opportunity to build that kind of grit. But I've dealt with deprivation my whole entire life uh, of, you know, having to get out there and, and really work for something. I opened up my business, not because it was a grand scheme of things that I had in my head to do. I opened it up because there were a lack of opportunities in my neighborhood. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Carl Allenby. I'm an emergency medicine resident physician at Cleveland Clinic Akron General. And I'm um, happy to have Elizabeth uh, invite me here today to speak to everyone. Yes, absolutely. And I invited you on because we've known each other for about two years um, and you're a great friend and mentor and I really appreciate everything that we've discussed in the past couple of months here, especially with first generation medical students. <laughs> and I will say this is probably the first guest that I've had that has your own little TV reel online. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you want to talk about that and your story a little bit. Sure. Yeah, why not? So I'm probably not your traditional medical student. Uh, for 25 years, I was a business owner. Uh, I started a business at the age of 19 in the auto repair business and uh, fixed cars for a living for a very long time. And eventually I was able to expand that to a uh, used car business. Um, had a couple locations for a while and uh, decided to go back to school uh, probably about my 15th or so year in business to pursue a business degree because I wanted to further grow my business. And uh, during the course of that, I took a biology course that just made me fall in love with medicine. And me not coming from the traditional background of people who go into medicine and me having no family in, uh, in medicine at all, um, it was kind of something that I just entertained as a child being a doctor, but never really thought of it as a possibility. Um, so much later in life, I was able to pursue that career. So I sold my business after 25 years, started medical school, and graduated uh, Northeast Ohio Medical University at the age of 47. And so now I'm here uh, as an emergency medicine physician and I'm loving it, just having a time in my life and uh, gonna be more happier with the career change. That's amazing. And I'm glad that you love residency. A lot of people don't like residency. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, so we do have in common the fact that we are both first generation medical students and our families none of them have been in medicine at all right um in fact most of my family uh hadn't gone to college and my parents were actually probably the first to go to college in my family i don't know if that's the same for you yeah my parents went to um went to college but never graduated from college i think they only had a couple years of uh, higher learning education um so yeah, I was in my generation, my sisters and brothers and I, we were the first to go off to college. Yeah. So what my parents actually went to trade school first and they ended up going back for their non-traditional degrees. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to even think that we made it this far to go to medical school. <laughs> and, you know, it's just like some weird deep ingrained interest that both of us had that we had to do. We had to complete it regardless of families or other people understanding that yeah yeah so growing up i i grew up in a really poor neighborhood in the city of east cleveland and um some uh media outlets have dubbed it as the poorest city in america um and the schools that i went to weren't so good schools and we grew up very poor i remember there were many times that we went without lights or water even and um, sometimes had to sneak over to the neighbor's house in the middle of the night just to get some water out of the tap uh, because ours was turned off and uh, there just weren't many role models in my neighborhood i mean now they're role models of people who were in white collar jobs you know so it was a very blue collar town and uh, there were a lot, a lot of families there who uh, you know worked for the uh, worked for the uh, bus garage um, or also like work for the city, 
as uh, garbage men. And these were admirable people. I mean, they got up and they went to work every day and they did, did their job, their jobs, and they were good to their families. Uh, so great role models in how to be a, a father and a man. Uh, but still, you know, there's something missing there when you don't have somebody who can help you navigate those, the rough waters of trying to find or trying to get through a you know, more robust education. Because you know, there's so many roadblocks that I think a lot of people who have that support, um, sometimes they don't even realize that those roadblocks are being navigated because their family has already gone through it and their family could give them tangible advice on how to do it. And it just seems like a second nature. But for us who are doing things for the first time, uh, sometimes it's very difficult and it's easy to get discouraged and to feel like you don't fit in uh, because you just don't have that background of people who have gone through it before to tell you, hey, this is normal. This is all right. You're going to be okay. Do you have a specific example of something that you wish you had some sort of mentor, wish you had some sort of family member to help you through? Yeah. So, so often you just run into these problems where you, where you don't have anybody to reach back to and say, Hey, is this, um, how do I, how do I get through this? Or is it supposed to be this hard? Or, but I ended up um, befriending a, a couple people much later on in my life uh, through the gym that I worked out at Severance Athletic Club at the time. And, um, both of the gentlemen who I hung out with were medical professionals. And I didn't know that at the time. One was an internal medicine doctor and the other one was a radiologist oncologist. And they were both African-American. And uh, we would just run into each other at the gym and they'd like to work out and I'd like to work out. So, uh, so that was really good and we just hit it off. And then when I found out they were doctors, uh, that was really encouraging because it was the, it was the first time that I actually knew personally um, doctors and you know people who worked in the medical field. Mm -hmm. And so when I decided that I wanted to pursue medicine, which was several years after that, um, having that connection between somebody who looked like me, somebody who did it before, made it much more tangible that I am much more real to myself that I was going to be able to accomplish it too. And, and they were able to give me encouragement all along the way. And they still do. Uh, they give me advice and we speak frequently. And, um, and it's been great. And additionally, I met my wife at the same gym. And uh, she's in the medical field as well. She's a physical therapist. And that I didn't know at the time as well either. And we just hung out and had a great time and, and the two physicians and I and my wife, we were all on the same, well, not my wife at the time, but we were all, the, all on the same running team and we just formed a bond and it was really great. And it's just great to know people who are in those positions so that you can kind of visualize yourself, put yourself in those shoes and to say, I know somebody personally and I know it's attainable and I know that you could be a real down to earth person and still um, be able to achieve these great things. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. And actually we met at LA Fitness. So yes, we <laughs> what's <did>. new <laughs> because of lifting. <laughs> the tradition of the gym lives on. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, so specifically with mentorship and speaking the medical language, um, and getting over roadblocks, did you feel out of place in general, like in medical school, especially because you came from a whole world outside of medicine to begin with, because you started like later in life and then you went back to school. So not only was it really foreign because of medical terminology and medical school and having it be hard, but you also had a whole family at home. You also came from the real world. Yeah, so it was definitely um, a disadvantage to not grow up around medicine. And look, I notice this with my girls now. My wife and I, we sit around on the table at the dinner table at night and we talk about different aspects of medicine and how our days went. And we use words that I know I never heard when I was a child. 
And mm -hmm. my kids repeat those words sometimes. And it's just amazing that they're able to pick up, uh, you know, words that may have taken me two or three years through medical school to learn how to pronounce. We sit here at the dinner table a lot of times and we have a conversation uh, about different treatment therapies or different diagnoses or different parts of the human body. And my girls are getting that at a very young age. They're eight and 10 years old right now. And they are totally immersed in medicine. And that's going to advantage them throughout their lives. And so I never had that. So a lot of words that I heard that were medically related were very difficult to pick up on initially to, uh, to know exactly what they mean, because these are things that I had never heard before. And I think that this is an advantage. And, it, you know, it's still is difficult sometimes to just um, to just feel like you're um, like you're really speaking the language of medicine when it's something that was foreign to me for 40 plus years. Um, so that's still a challenge that I work on, and I have frequent com conversations with people who I know are first generation in medicine as well, uh, and they have the same kind of interpretation that I have, that it's difficult and that they have to work very hard in order to um, to, uh, to just put it all together uh, because it's just something that wasn't taught to them, taught to them when they were much younger. Mm -hmm. And I've also heard quotes like, the true understanding is being able to simplify things. Um, if we finally get a good understanding, we work really hard to understand medical terminology and understand concepts then we can break it down the other way to tell our patients and to talk to our patients in real terminology that they understand. Whereas other physicians sometimes will just speak medical jargon to them and they don't understand what they're saying. Then they leave the doctor's office even more confused than when they you know, showed up. Yeah, so that's been, ironically, a real advantage that I've had in medicine is that me being a professional in the automotive field, I learned long ago that I need to speak to my patient's level. I need to make sure that they're understanding me. And I, and I know those um, verbal and physical cues that they may give when they're not quite understanding what I'm saying. And I'm used to taking complicated um, automotive or electrical or mechanical jargon and breaking it down and simplifying it so that people can understand. So I'm able to employ those same skills right back into medicine. And also another advantage that I, I feel like I have is that I've been working on differential diagnoses my whole life, coming up with plausible answers for what somebody may present with um, because it's what I had to do in my automotive field. So it's been something that I've been able to take and turn around and, and use that in my medical life as well. So there have definitely been a lot of similarities between medicine and, um, and my former career. That's an mm -hmm. advantage that I realize a lot of people have. And additionally, I've been told that I'm pretty good with people, you know, with, with bedside manner and people skills, which, um, which is something that I don't feel like I'm doing intentionally. Uh, I don't have to think about it, but I've been dealing with the general public for so long and giving people bad news about their car or giving them a diagnosis or, you know, telling them unpleasant information, uh, that that has seemed to be something that has come easier to me, which I didn't even realize is the feedback that I get from my supervisors, from the supervising attendants that I work with every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just great to know that there's some things that I do have that provide me an advantage. So it's not at a complete, you know, I'm not at a complete disadvantage because I didn't grow up around medicine. Um, but I think it all evens out in some strange way. Right. I mean, arguably it makes you a better physician because you can relate to your patients more, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, there's so many times that I'm dealing with a patient and they remind me ironically of somebody who I already know. And it's like one of the most amazing things, everybody, no matter where they've come from, no matter if they're rich or poor or old or young or gay or straight or 
um, or just anywhere, no matter their religion or, or their background, their ethnicity. Um, I, in some way, it just feels like I could relate with people. And, um, and I also have like genuine empathy because I know that life can suck. You know, I grew up in a mm -hmm. poor neighborhood where life was bad for a lot of people and times were hard for a lot of people. And I, and I sympathize those who are going through things, whether financially or medically, um, because I know that, that, that things aren't easy and sometimes they need to have a caring voice or a caring person uh, there to serve them. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that also speaks to professionalism and integrity, you know, like giving people bad news and bringing it down to a level that A, they can understand and B, that you're telling the truth and you're not sugarcoating anything is a huge skill to, to gain in the real world and you can't be taught that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm willing to do anything for my patients, you know, no matter what it is. You know, I've had patients who have said that they're cold or I noticed that they're maybe shivering in their bed or just kind of rubbing their arms as they're talking to me and I ask them if they want me to get them a blanket or if, they're, if they appear that they're hungry or I know that they're homeless, I ask them if they want food and some of them have commented that it's, um, oh, well, you know, that's, that's beneath you. I don't want you to go and get me any blankets. I'll ask the nurse when she comes back in here. No, 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 no. I got, I got you. Um, because I'm just willing to do everything in order to provide them some kind of comfort and care uh, to help them along. And that, to me, allows them to open up a little bit more to me and to give me more information about their complaints and um, or whatever their illness is and um, it feels like I'm able to serve, serve them better so it's a win-win mm -hmm. and that's that's part of being a good person in my opinion being you know multifaceted you can do everything that you can possibly do in your power to help your patient um, it just shows that you're in it for the right reasons and it just shows that you're a good person in general and you would do it regardless of if they were your patient yeah, that is true. <laughs> I to, yeah, I just try to look out for folks. You know, if I see a nurse struggling with a patient, I don't care if that patient's not mine. If I see that she's trying to get somebody, uh, he or she are trying to get somebody up into bed, and I walk in there and help them out. Or, you know, if it's coming up to the end of my shift and somebody needs me to go the extra mile to do something, hey, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's also a work ethic uh, coming from a first generation medical student. You know, we clawed our way to get here, um, to get into school to begin with, and then to get through school, which I'm still halfway there, you're done. But, <laughs> um, and it just continues through the whole gamut of medical education. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely an, an uphill battle that we have to climb. And, um, there's not a lot of financial resources available to me outside of what I'm able to provide for myself because, you know, there's, there's no rich folks in, in my family. Uh, me being a business owner, I was always seen as like one of the more successful ones as I was growing up. And so I was even then asked to do a lot with what I had, um, even though I had children and a, you know, a family to raise a business to run uh, people uh, seem to kind of lean on me uh, because of what I was able to do for myself in business right and yeah so everything that I've done you know outside of the love and, and just genuine support that I've had from my family and friends uh, you know financially it all falls on me and God knows I have a lot of student loans to pay <laughs> mm -hmm. and at some point uh, you know those have to be paid off and um and it's something that i'm just going to have to work on it's a, it's the responsibility that i bear right and that definitely comes with well first of all medical school is very expensive um and second of all you know we have to side hustle and do whatever we have to do to meet that deadline that loan deadline that payment um or getting a scholarship or you know, somehow making it all come together. Whereas, you know, maybe people who have a long line of physicians in their family have 
at least some sort of planning that they always wanted to go into medicine. They planned it. They possibly have money to go. They don't have any problem paying off their loans. And that's all they have to worry about is school. Whereas, you know, like disadvantaged um, people or people coming from a family who doesn't have that background might not have that. Yeah, that's, um, that's definitely true. You know, I had uh, people who I went to school with who, when I would ask them like, hey, so how many people are you, in your family are in medicine? And there were a few who would say, oh, I'm first gen, you know, this is the first thing for me. But there were several people who would say, everybody in my family is a medicine. Everybody I know is a medicine. It's expected that I go into medicine. And mm -hmm. sadly, there were some who said, I don't even know if this is what I want to do. Uh, but I'm here because it's the legacy of my family. And it's a tradition that I'm expected to follow. And I remember one night down in Cadaver Lab in my first night of uh, I mean, in my first year of medicine, uh, first semester, I was speaking with one of the younger students there. And I think he was just about 19 or 20 at the time. And I was, um, you know, applauding him to say, hey, man, dude, this is great. I mean, you're going to be a doctor by the age you were, by the age of 24. I mean, isn't this like the greatest thing in life ever? And he's like, I never really wanted to go to medical school. And I could see like just the emotion inside of him. Um, you know, just because it's not his destiny that he feels like he's fulfilling. It's, he doesn't even know his call and he's so young that he doesn't really know his call. And, um, and that was really, uh, that was really a telling moment that not everybody's here because they want to be here. For some people, it is a legacy. And um, I had another friend who told me, hey, Carl, my only, the only responsibility I have is to get through medical school. That's all that my parents want. All of my, my entire tuition is paid for. Everything I want to eat, my car, my housing, everything is 100% paid for. This is my only responsibility is to get through medical school. And, um, you know, I, I wish that I had that, but at the same time, uh, me having to work really hard and uh, work my way, uh, you know, save everything that I could and be mindful of what I was spending and mindful of my time uh, just made me that more committed to succeeding through medical school. Um, right, if there's yeah. no plan B, then you gotta go through it and you gotta do it, right? Yeah, and you definitely have to have resiliency in school. Like, um, I know for a long time they were, I sat on the admissions committee at Neomed, um, as well as um, I was one of the student trustees as well for the board. And through the admissions committee, we were always trying to come up with something other than just MCAT score as far as like admission to medical school. So what other things could we look at? And MCAT score is really the only objective thing that you can look at to say, hey, in comparison to, to these other people, this person got this score, this person got this score. And so therefore, you know, one is allowed to come to medical school and the other one, uh, sorry, you're gonna have to, uh, you know, reapply or, or do something different. But uh, on our admissions committee, trying to find a more holistic approach to the medical school application, uh, we try to uh, put a figure on resiliency, on grit, perseverance, all of those things that, um, that, that you need in order to be successful in almost any field that's extremely mm -hmm. challenging. So it's Absolutely. not what you do when, yeah, it's not what you do when things are easy. But what do you do when things are hard? It really makes the difference. Right. And ironically, you know, when we met, my MCAT score was what was the barrier to get me into school. So I had to do my master's and uh, work at a lab job for a year and take a gap year. Or so got that grit, I guess. But it was the MCAT score that originally was the issue for me to get in. 
Yeah, and, and a specific MCAT score doesn't mean that you're not going to be successful in medical school. I mean, I had a really average MCAT score, but I did really well throughout medical school and on my board test and even uh, our ongoing in-service tests, I do really well at those. Um, because, you know, there's a certain method that I have learned in order to do well on those from building resiliency, from not giving up, from the times when things are hard, that's when I put my nose to the grind and say, you know, I'm gonna get this done um, some way, somehow. Mm -hmm. And people need that. And sometimes when you're, um, you know, when, when you're given a lot, um, you never get the opportunity to build that kind of grit. But I've dealt with deprivation my whole entire life uh, of, you know, having to get out there and, and really work for something. I opened up my business, not because it was a grand scheme of things that I had in my head to do. I opened it up because there were a lack of opportunities in my neighborhood. I was working a minimum wage job at a parts store. And that was the best job that I could find. I mean, I searched high and low, but for a kid who's just out of high school, uh, there just weren't many opportunities there. Uh, you know, going to college wasn't something that I, that I really saw myself doing. I did go to trade school. You know, I went to uh, the local community college for automotive technology. So I was able to do that while running my business in the morning. I would do that at night. Um, but traditional college for me just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I saw my sister go off to school, uh, my older sister who went to Kent State, and she struggled just really badly with being able to, to just provide some of the bare necessities for herself. And I remember she was eating um, noodles and crackers almost every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just trying to make a few dollars that she had stretch. And she ended up having to come back home. Uh, I think just after about a year of being in college and she was able to later go and finish uh, her degree and ended up uh, getting a doctorate of education uh, eventually. But seeing that when I was uh, quite a few years younger than her, I think I was about four or five years younger than her, it didn't make college seem like something that, that was going to be for me. I mean, I'm going to go there and almost starve to death. I'm going to barely make it. And more than likely, I'm going to have to come home because I won't be able to afford it. I mean, that, that was just a reality and the reality of so many people who grow up in disadvantaged neighborhoods uh, when they're considering higher education. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't know. I came from a small town, but we were always kind of expected to go to college, me and my brother. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I don't know in why or what, but we were always kind of expected to go for something. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I always knew this is what I want to do forever. I don't know why, but <laughs> I'm not changing my mind. And this is always, you know, something that was my calling. Um, and then my brother chose engineering. So, you know, he made it. <laughs> but um, it was always an interesting spread especially coming from a small like farming town you know most people would just go to high school be done and then you work on their family's farm forever and that's mm -hmm. just what they did yeah and then everybody else would go to community college in the area and stay in berks county forever which is where i'm from and then <laughs> there's the select few that would leave and it was always like the honor student kids who were in band and sports and honors classes all together and then they would just leave and go to college. yeah it's hard to break that cycle because, you know, you get trapped in it. You have a family who has expectations for you. They bring you up in that way to say, you know, this is going to be what you do. And they kind of push you in that way. And although, you know, you have self-determination and you have your own ideals of what you would like to be, um, there's always people in the background who may have thoughts of what they see you as being, especially if they're your parents or other people in your community. And then it just comes down to the fact of, can you visualize yourself as that? I know for me, you know, you walk into uh, mostly any um, hospital around, at least when I was younger, and um, I saw people who looked everything but like me. And it makes it seem like, well, you know, medicine 
isn't for black folks. You know, I see other African Americans maybe, you know, being a janitor or being a nurse and every once in a while you may run into an African American position, but largely uh, we were missing from there. And uh, when kids see that, when impressionable kids see that, then they believe that this life isn't something that's attainable for me because nobody here looks like me. Uh, you know, and sometimes we had the blame game that sometimes African Americans only want to do sports or be rappers, but that's what we see. That's what we see is the the way it's your only poverty for us. Yeah, it's our only or or our largest example mm -hmm. of how to be successful and to escape poverty is to either um, be some kind of a sports figure or uh, some sort of mus musician. And that just makes it much more difficult when you think outside the box and you wanna do things outside the box and you don't see, or you see very few people who represent uh, where you come from. Right, and that's the same thing with just anything that you wanna do that's outside of expectations or role models that you see in real life. Um, like in high school, everybody always asks you like, who's your role model? What do you want to do when you grow up? And I was always like, I don't know. I have no role model. Like I'm my own role model because there's no one that I knew that was a female physician that left a small town to go be a physician or to get into medical school. Like I didn't know anyone like that. Yeah. So I was like, I don't have one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What that said, it is a challenging road. I mean, it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's going to have, you're going to have setbacks, you're going to have disappointments, but hey, that's life. Life is setbacks and disappointments. And for our younger listeners out there who uh, may not know that. <laughs> <laughs> life is suffering. <laughs> yeah. uh, but life does get, you know, you get used to it. And I am really in a good place. I mean, although I am a resident, I'm new to the field of uh, medicine, relatively new to the field of medicine. I love being a doctor. I love having my patients as I'm able to take care of just as much as I love my customers when I was in business and being able to take care of their automotive needs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just my personality that allows me to, uh, to just care for people in such a manner. And I think that's largely true of most people who go into medicine is that they want to help people you know, more than anything. Uh, I've always said that money is a byproduct of job, and I'm not here for the money. I'm here because I want, this is what I see my purpose as. And if I'm able to provide myself a, a good living because of that, then, then great. Um, and that will come. But my first priority is to the people I serve, uh, not to how large my bank account is. Exactly. And the same here. Um, and it also is a testament to our student loans that we are willing to take on. Um, Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, it's like kind of scary to look at things like that and be like, well, you know, what if I fail? Or what if I get there and I can't do it? Or, you know, the multitude of life things that could happen. Yeah. And that's where that grit and perseverance comes in. You, you have to keep that. So if you keep that going, you'll get it done. Yeah. Well, and also we have the gym. So <laughs> exactly. When times get hard, I go to the gym. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. After exams, everyone's like, let's go out for drinks. And I'm like in the gym murdering myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, that brings up a funny story. Every We have a, a Neomid. There is a very nice gym that they built um, a few years ago, and it's still really nice, uh, but it's really close to the main classrooms. And so every day for lunch, I would eat, uh, coming up to noon, I would eat part of my meal. And by noon, as soon as class ended, I'd hit the gym and I'd work out for, you know, 50 minutes or so, and then run back to class, you know, clean up really quickly and run back to class and eat the second half of my lunch. And that's what I did for my years there because I really put an emphasis on working out. It made me think better, uh, it made me more alert, uh, broke up the monotony of the day just sitting around. And um, 
And it was just one of my priorities was working out. I definitely wanted to keep some sort of physique while going through medical school and sitting in a chair and listening to lectures for hours on end throughout the day. Um, you definitely need something to break it up. And for me to just sit in a chair and have lunch and then slowly drag myself back to class would just not work for me. <laughs> so I, I love this gym. It is my, <laughs> it's my saving grace. Yeah, absolutely. And your, your family goes with you now, right? Or no? Uh, well, ever since COVID, uh, the daycare <laughs> at the gym has been closed. And so my girls are getting big enough now. They're nine and almost 11 and they're very mature girls. Um, you know, so I don't mind leaving them at home for a little while by themselves if I need to, or like when they're in uh, daycare, uh, well, in camps, I should say now, no more mm -hmm. daycare for them. Uh, I'm able to go and work out during those times too. So it's still mm -hmm. a priority. I probably don't work out as, off, as often as I should, but it's still something I regularly do. Good, which is awesome. Um, and also, we both like hands-on work, and COVID kind of ruined that for medical students at the moment. Um, like last semester, we couldn't do any hands-on labs or anything like that, and that's like an integral part of learning for us. So now I'm going back to boot camp on Monday. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's definitely put a damper on the on the medical community and the students that are relying on uh, hospitals to to train them and to give them uh, that experience of patient care. Um, we just recently started letting students come back to uh, Cleveland Clinic Akron General um, and letting them participate in patient care. But if we have somebody who we suspect may have COVID if they have any kind of respiratory issues or any signs or symptoms that could be associated with COVID, mm -hmm. then we typically don't let them uh, see those patients um, because we want to keep them safe. Uh, they're there to learn. Uh, we're the workforce, um, but they're largely there to learn as much as they can. And, and I want to keep them safe. And so do my supervisors and, um, all of the other physicians and medical staff who works there. We want everybody to be safe and that's just the best thing that we could do for the students who come in. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's taking away from anyone's learning to not be on the front lines as much or no? Um, possibly, but it's a, it's a small amount. I mean, most of, what people want to do as a medical student is to be involved in the in um, the decision making process of their patients and in their care and to see as many normals as as you can because you have to go through a lot of normals until you say wait a minute that's not normal <laughs> mm -hmm. uh and that's important to to see so you need to be there for the experience and it's not necessary that you see everything. Uh, I mean, obviously, maybe some of the advanced procedures, uh, like intubations, chest tubes, and uh, you know some of the traumas that we deal with, you may not be able to see those. But largely, I mean, there's enough patients who come in with just your, you know, everyday things uh, that you're able to really learn from, and those other kind of experiences. Uh, will come. You know, in medicine, sometimes it feels like I need to know everything today. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like the expectation is, oh my God, why do you not know this? But the things that are really important, you're going to hear five, six, ten times. They're going to be displayed to you over and over again. Uh, those really important things are going to be things that are highlighted to you throughout your young career. And uh, why, while it may feel that you're missing out or that you really need to know these things today, um, some of those can wait <laughs> and you'll get your, you'll get your turn. Good. That's good to know. Um, and then what do you think about the current science coming out behind COVID or anything 
any current event science that we learn most of the stuff for boards in medical school, right? And then we see most of the stuff that we need to know in residency or clinicals. And then there's also current science that we need to keep up on as a professional. So what do you think about applying current science to your practice? Is that something that is largely focused on while you're working or not? Yeah, well, you definitely want to use evidence-based medicine in your decision-making. You, you want to do things that you know aren't going to be harmful for your patients and that's going to uh, help them out as best as you can. Um, so you definitely have to be up on the latest trends in medicine. And uh, like one um, older physician told me one day, Carl, what you learn in medical school will be, uh, a lot of the concepts will be obsolete by the time you're done with residency. And what you learn in residency will be a lot of the things, the techniques that you say may, uh, that you do may seem barbaric <laughs> uh, five or 10 years from now, and we won't do that anymore. So it's constantly changing. It's, there are things that you have to stay abreast of on. But then also you need to have that valuable skill of knowing how to, uh, how to take a test and pass an exam. And I, I know that sometimes they're overrated, but I look at it this way. If I know like all of the existential things that they test you for on an examination, if I, if I know all of those and I could do well on those, then surely I can do well on those basic things. So a lot of tests test you on things that are not so common and not as probable. Um, but if you know those things well, number one, you, Will increase the, it will increase the chance that you'll know it when you do get the rare opportunity to see it. And then second, if you know those more complicated or obscure um, type of occurrences, then you're bound to know more of the, of the everyday things that you're gonna see. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that I look at it. I'm a silver lining type of guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is uh, good. Yeah. Positive attitude is everything, right? Yeah, I like to walk in the rain, you know, so when it's raining outside, I don't get gloomy. I put on my, uh, I put on my galoshes, <laughs> if they still use that term, and I'll go walking in the rain some days. <laughs> Good. You know, I definitely take my 10-minute walks. <laughs> Obsessed with that. Um, and the social distance walking is good, right? <laughs> We've had a couple of those together, which I've enjoyed, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the social distance walking is great. You know, being outside, reducing transmission of COVID, and Zoom. Zoom is great too. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any other topic that you wanted to talk about or bring up? Um, nothing in particular that I can think of. I know that you and I want to talk about eventually ethics and in, uh, in medicine and just things like social media, which I think is a, is an important topic for younger for our younger audience who may not realize the implications of having so much of their life exposed to the entire world um indefinitely um, <laughs> so i think it's uh something